as much as we're we're sort of almost overstimulated in our culture and it feels like we're around a lot of people, it feels like maybe we're engaging a lot of people again because of uh, social media and things mm. like that. There does also seem to be a big problem with isolation and loneliness. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah. I, I think this came, came through very clearly actually during lockdown because mm -hmm. all the studies that were done um, over lockdown, um, uh, you know, every everybody kind of found it very tiresome and and irritating. You know, not to be able to go out and do the kinds of things you're doing. But it all the all the studies have sh suggested very strongly that women found it much harder than the men. Mm. You know, the men kind of went, "Oh God, means I'll have to spend another two hours online on on my gaming program." <laughs> 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 oh well that's not so bad you know? <laughs> whereas whereas the women were kind of getting much more frustrated and um you know i guess depressed maybe and so on because yeah. they couldn't go and see um uh their friends in the way that or their you know family in the way that they did and quite clearly you know uh, despite the magic of zoom and, and uh skype and all these other uh digital uh media um it just didn't quite work in the same way i mean it's really interesting seeing how it was used and what people's experiences of it was it seems to have worked okay uh for family mm. um be because one of the problems you have with with anything like this online um is you cannot have more than four people in a conversation period you know it's an, that that isn't how life works just like if you don't believe me just go and watch the next reception you're at you'll see it before your eyes <laughs> you cannot have more than four people in a conversation if a fifth person joins it'll be two conversations two separate conversations within 30 seconds if right. even that long right. now um the problem with digital media like you know zoom and skype and so on you can have 500 people on there but the thing very quickly gets dominated by the four people with the loudest voices and everybody else retreats into the background, um, you know, and, and, you know, and spends their time paying half an ear to the conversation and, and checking their news feeds and their email and watching the cats fighting in the backyard and uh, <laughs> all these other things to, that are there to distract you. So, so um, you know, the, that, that, you know, if, for family relationships are much more tolerant of four people uh, dominating the conversation because that's probably you know what happens anyway at, at, at thanksgiving <laughs> dinners <laughs> um uh, uh uh but you know it, it it doesn't work if it's not family it didn't seem to work terribly well uh after a while with groups of friends so a lot of people kind of you know had regular kind of once a week or maybe more often um zoom sessions with uh the the group of friends their girlfriends or, or or whatever um and it it kind of paled into a form of tedium after you know a month or two and, and and people just you know didn't get the buzz out of it i think that they expected family things work okay not friendships uh meetings with strangers or business meetings with the folks you work with uh just didn't have the kind of uh, excitement that you might have expected they don't and don't have the excitement of the kind of face-to-face -face. if you had that ex meeting is face-to-face it would be a completely different experience and it's because the dynamics of a face-to-face -face environment are very different and allow you to do more things form sub conversations and things like that in a way you can't online yeah, I think one of the things that we did learn over the pandemic was that you can't actually replace a, a real, you know, sitting around having drinks with your friends with a Zoom yeah. cocktail out. Or it's yeah. just not the same. <laughs> yes. Yes. I actually well, found it know. depressing. And I, I, you know, I think I tried a couple of times and then decided that that was making me feel worse than not doing it at all. <laughs> just, uh, not to be too cynical, you know. Uh, your dress doesn't get wet when somebody else spills their drink. No. <laughs> There's something missing. Totally different experience. <laughs> and, and I think that probably goes back to what the issue is here. And that is, in the context of everyday 
meetings that we have with our friends, casual meetings, whether it's, you know, uh, for a coffee or just taking a walk in the park or having dinner with them or, 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 or a beer in a bar or whatever it may be that you do, we engage in a huge amount of physical contact with them. We're forever, you know, patting them on the back and stroking their arms and giving them a hug and mm -hmm. all these kind of things. Yeah, we don't do it with everybody. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and it's very clear. I mean, we've we've actually done studies of this all over Europe and in Japan, and the picture you get is very very similar. Uh, how much of the body is you is permissible to touch, and you feel comfortable about touching somebody or them touching you, depends very much on the closeness of the relationship. Mm. But once you get beyond about. 50 people in your network we think it's probably about there and that would probably count out to about your cousins your good friends and your cousins and anybody else closer than that um beyond that number you you don't really engage in this physical kind of uh contact touching soft touch as it's sometimes called um with people and and by the time you get out to strangers you know, it's at arm's length and the only all over this, this huge sample across up and down and left to right of Europe and, and in Japan, every, everybody was absolutely consistent. If it's a stranger, the only place they're allowed to touch you is your hand. Hmm. Right. So which is basically saying I'm sort of extending a little bit of me in your direction, but you ain't coming any closer. <laughs> Not until I know you better. <laughs> so, yeah. but, uh, you know, aside from that side, for these kind of more central, meaningful relationships that we have, friendships and family relationships, you know, these kind of little casual touches are going on all the time. And they really uh, are, are harking back to the way primates use social bonding, uh, social grooming, leafing through the fur and, and removing bits of vegetation, rubbish and stuff, mm. um, is used to bond relationships. It's a very physical based thing. And of course we don't have, you know, a body full of fur anymore. Uh, we just have a, a little bit left on, on, on the top of the head, <laughs> as it were. Uh, and so in, because we don't have the fur covering to do all this, classic primate type social grooming leafing through the fur um we've substituted that with you know things like uh, caresses and and strokes and hugs and 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 the like because they do the same job and the same job here is triggering the endorphin system so we have this highly specialized neural system in the skin which is responds to one uh thing and one thing only and that is light slow stroking at a rate of just under two inches a second huh. and that and that is the speed of movement of the hands across the fur as they're sort of parting the fur when they're grooming each other uh, that you see in primate social grooming and it's sort of about the speed of you know a, a stroke on the arm or a, a pat on the back as it were and it, it it's triggering the endorphin system and providing this very, very old, ancient, if you like, primitive uh, mechanism that triggers the endorphin system and makes you feel bonded. And you know, it's obviously, you know, conveying other kinds of signals as well. That you know, I sometimes dis describe this as: if you really want to know how somebody feels about you, ignore what they say because it's probably lies anyway. <laughs> check out how they touch you because you cannot lie in the when you touch somebody else it, it's a completely honest declaration of how you feel about them yeah um and you know that's what you should and it's, it goes back to this very very ancient primate um uh way of creating and building social bonds yeah that's so interesting it. yeah yeah you know we've we've added lots of other <clears throat> uh, mechanisms <clears throat> excuse me lots of other mechanisms on top of grooming so things like laughter and singing and dancing and feasting <clears throat> and telling stories and these kind of things which also trigger the endorphin system as it turns out but these supplement <clears throat> physical contact essentially 